good afternoon and happy first day of summer. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Virginia Transit Association's webinar, Hit the Highlights, Outtakes from the 2018 VTA Conference Roundtable Session. So for those of you who missed these presentations at the conference, you are in for a treat. I'm Lisa Guthrie, the Executive Director of the Virginia Transit Association. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website along with the slides for on-demand viewing. We'll save all the questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar after all the panelists have presented. We, of course, encourage you to send in your questions anytime during the presentation, and here's how to do that. Look for the webinar panel on your screen and simply type your question into the question box. Although they'll be answered at the end of the webinar, you can submit your question at any time and we will hold on to them. Remember that the audience is muted, so we'll be unable to hear you during the webinar. There are some video um, aspects of the presentation and that has slowed down the, uh, the speed of the presentation. So we ask you to please be patient on that. If you are having um, trouble with reception, uh, with the loading, please um, type that into the question box as well so we'll be aware of that. We have several important presentations from the conference roundtable session so we'll provide you with a great deal of valuable information. And our panelists for today's webinar are David Harmer from the Virginia Transit Liability Pool, who will present on developing a culture of safety in your agency. Tom Fox from Blacksburg Transit will discuss driver recruitment, expanding our reach. Joe Green of WMATA and Tim Barham with GRTC will talk about Respect the Ride Code of Conduct. And we'll wrap it up with Bob Schneider with PRTC OmniRide discussing transit talking points for decision makers. We thank these member volunteers for sharing their skills and their time with us today. With that, it is our great pleasure that I turn the webinar over to our first presenter, David. David, take it away. Thank you, Lisa. This is David Harmer with VTLP and uh, appreciate the uh, Transit Association giving us this chance to talk about these uh, these topics. I'm going to be talking about safety culture a little bit today. And uh, we feel this at the at the transit pool is a very important topic um, uh, for reducing losses and for the uh, the health of the uh, transit agency in general. This thing actually came out of a, a day long seminar and we we pared it down to an hour uh, for the conference. And we're going to try and do this in, in 10 minutes right now. So I'm going to talk fast, uh, but I think you can listen faster than I can talk, so we should be all right. Uh, safety culture. Uh, we're very interested in safety culture because it's not a, a laser-focused uh, topic. It's not real technical. It's more like a philosophical outlook. It's a framework of thinking, uh, which, if adopted, uh, can be applied to any situations. Uh, decisions when decisions have to be made at, at uh, any turning point. So we think it's uh, applicable uh, in, in a very broad way. Uh, the agenda is up there, uh, and again, this is this is from a longer presentation. But why is it important? Uh, defining safety culture, uh, the components of a positive safety culture, um, and that's interesting because. Uh, Positive safety culture. All transit agencies have a safety culture. Some are some are bad, some are good. It's a continuum. Uh, everybody has one. So we'll talk about how to assess your safety culture, uh, so you can tell where you are, where the gaps might be, where improvement might be needed, and then taking that steps to improve the safety culture. Best practices. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, today uh, for lack of time. And then once you have a, a positive safety culture, how to maintain that over time. Why does it matter? Uh, see a picture on the screen there, kind of tells the story. Uh, if there's not a good safety culture, uh, things go wrong, people get hurt, uh, there's claims, there might be property damage, uh, there, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's bad for morale. Um, it could get to the media, uh, maybe the blame game starts to get played and people uh, looking for uh, someone to blame uh, for things that go wrong. Uh, it's not good with with a poor safety culture. And safety is fundamental to the mission of any transit agency. I'm sure you all could recite your mission statement. 
uh, if asked, but probably it has something to do with uh, moving people safely. And uh, safety is, is part of the mission. Uh, so that's why this is important. What is a culture of safety? Uh, if you think about it, the word culture, uh, the root word uh, of the word culture is cult. Cult. What, what is a cult? It's a great devotion to a person, idea, movement, or work. So we're looking at a, a great devotion to an idea. So we're actually talking about a cult, a cult of safety. And uh, a safety culture is the personality of an organization. It's the combination of characteristics, qualities that form an organization's character. Uh, this term, culture, uh, safety culture, came out of the uh, Chernobyl uh, nuclear disaster, uh, where they did the look back uh, after that and did the postmortem on, on what had happened, what had gone wrong. And uh, they found that it wasn't any one thing or even a couple of things. It was you know, decision after decision that was made uh, that was did not take safety first. And the conclusion was that there was not a good safety culture, uh, and that's what led to that disaster. What does it look like? Uh, mutual trust, share perception of importance of safety. That's talking about mutual trust uh, between management and frontline employees. Um, that there is uh, that feeling of trust, shared perception, importance of safety. As you'll see through this uh, presentation, uh, there's, the theme is uh, often uh, the importance of management in the safety culture. Uh, it's not something that can be delegated uh, to a great extent. Uh, it really requires the involvement and the commitment of the CEO and the top people uh, for it to be effective. So there has to be a mutual trust uh, between the employees that if they say anything, uh, that it won't be held against them, not necessarily, and that there's a shared perception of this importance, that it's not just them, it's not just the drivers or the mechanics that are expected to to have a positive safety culture, that, that everybody thinks it's important. Uh, just quickly, uh, we're talking about leadership here, um, and this is uh, Winston Churchill, a uh, great leader from World War II. But it's just a, an indicator. The CEO, again, is clearly the leader of the organization for safety. And uh, the CEO needs to take the lead, an emphasis on safety and repeating those values uh, at every opportunity. And when interacting, not just with employees, but with their board of directors and any stakeholders, uh, whether that be vendors, contractors, uh, that the safety message uh, comes first. Uh, that safety is front center and it's the leading principle of the organization. Um, we'll talk later about the idea of uh, beginning management meetings with safety, uh, rather than maybe waiting till the end, uh, leading with it, even if it's just to say, does anybody have any safety concerns? Uh, but to make that the the uh, the lead off, I like this uh, Dilbert comic here. Our, our highest priority is safety, except when it's hard, unprofitable, or we're busy. And uh, you might have seen things uh, operate like that at times. Um, the components of a positive safety culture: uh, again, strong leadership, management, organizational commitment, employee and union shared ownership. Uh, adversarial relationship many times between uh, management and uh, unions, uh, but hopefully when it comes to safety, there can be agreement. Uh, open, frequent, effective communication, uh, proactive use of uh, uh, data, key indicators, benchmarking, not just uh, lagging indicators, but leading indicators. Uh, employee recognition and reward programs, and again, the uh, high level of organizational trust. This is a little bit of theory on safety culture. Just quickly, uh, this is a model from uh, Dr. James Reason, the uh, industrial psychologist that's widely used. And uh, his, his, this is his theory, uh, safety culture, he calls it an informed culture, and it's made of these different aspects. Next slide. Uh, so the informed culture is made up of these things, reporting culture, just culture, flexible culture, learning culture. And he says you need all these to have a positive safety culture. Reporting culture, 
is where employees are uh, encouraged and not afraid to report uh, things that need uh, attention. Uh, it's the frontline employees that really know what's going on to a large degree in regard to safety. And if they're encouraged to speak up, it can be very valuable. And that's this kind of near miss reporting program idea. The just culture is the idea that everybody makes mistakes and that unintentional errors, unsafe acts won't be unjustly punished, uh, that there won't be a, uh, a blame game uh, situation. And the flexible culture that the organization is willing and able to change uh, to improve safety. And of course, learning uh, is training and drawing conclusions about uh, from data uh, to make improvements. Uh, talked about assessing your safety culture um, to see where you are. Uh, and there's several ways to do this. Um, direct observation, interviews, focus groups, surveys are, are the big four. Direct observation is actually watching people do their job. So a little bit time consuming. Uh, interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews would be very effective, kind of time consuming. Uh, focus groups, of course, getting groups together, facilitated groups, that uh, depends on a, a good facilitator for that to be effective, or written surveys sent out to everyone, which gets a wide scope, uh, but has its own drawbacks. Next. So the recommendation is uh, to use a combination of uh, written surveys and focus groups as the most uh, efficient uh, way to go about this, most cost effective. And to repeat that every two or three years uh, to take the temperature, see what the safety culture looks like, where the gaps are, uh, so that uh, management can tell where to focus attention, where to focus resources. Steps on the path to improve safety culture. This is a, a kind of a busy slide, um, but if you just look at um, the first uh, the first word in many of those bullet points is CEO. And this just kind of amplifies the idea that the importance of the CEO being visible and present in this. They don't have to do everything, but they have to be visible and they have to give it their uh, support. So th these are steps to improve uh, secure commitment for management union leadership at highest levels to improve. That's just getting people to agree. We need, we need to improve. We agree. And, and getting that buy-in and then uh, getting commitment from other uh, stakeholders, creating a task force. This is where there is delegation. The CEO can create a task force to do this, but has to stay on top of it. And the task force or consultant to uh, conduct the assessment, create a roadmap, uh, and then meet with employee leaders, uh, shop foremen, road supervisors, get their buy-in, explain it, and then with the frontline employees. And they're getting back with feedback on a, on a regular basis. Maintaining over time, uh, again, these bullet points, you see the first word in most of them is management or managers, and that's the importance. Management walks the talk, provides necessary resources, meaning money. Management's highly visible on vehicles, maintenance shops, safety meetings, training sessions. Uh, I, you know, the importance even of, I can speak from experience conducting a, a training seminar, having the CEO come in uh, just for a few minutes, just to greet the attendees, as it, say something about the importance of safety, uh, go so far, it, it can take five minutes. Uh, management starting every leadership meeting with a discussion of safety issues, taking responsibility for failures and, and giving the frontline credit for the success, Management 101, and the constant communication and then the last one, the idea of catching employees doing something right. It's a, a psychology 101, you know, shaping behavior. You see anything that goes toward the behavior you want, reward it. Uh, and there, are, I'm sure you have uh, many reward programs out there that'll accomplish that. And that is a lot in a short time. Um, uh, uh, glad to answer any questions you might have. Um, we do have a, a survey, uh, a, a written survey template. If anybody would be interested in that, we can send that along upon request. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, David. If anybody has any questions for David, please type them into your question box now. All right. We'll move on now to Tom Fox from Blacksburg Transit, who will talk about driver recruitment. Tom? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. 
So I'm going to talk about an issue that's facing just about every transit agency these days, and that's hiring and keeping bus operators. So if you go to the next slide, please. Just a quick overview of Blacksburg Transit. We have 15 routes and 69 vehicles. We operate in the town of Blacksburg and the adjacent town of Christiansburg, and we're a department of the town of Blacksburg. Our major trip generator is Virginia Tech. It generates you know, close to 90% of our ridership, so our service level does vary through the year. Less service when tech is not in session, so that sort of puts us in a position of being able to only support a small number of full-time operators, so as a result, 70% of our employees are part-time employees. Next, please. So I'm going to kind of talk about a, a case study that that kind of hit us in the fall of 2015. We we were we're falling behind on on wage rates. We're having a serious problem uh, recruiting recruiting bus operators. We were actually 25% understaffed in the fall of 2015, and our initial response was kind of tepid. I guess I would say. We increased wages a little bit. We put in uh, some bonus plans and, and started allowing more overtime. And we ended up having to cut some service because that was really not a very effective strategy. And as a result, ridership dropped. Next, please. So, so we took a step back and we looked uh, a little more about a, at a comprehensive strategy. And, and I think a pretty bold strategy focused on three different aspects. One was pay and incentives second advertising and outreach, and the third is retention. I'll talk about each one of these individually, but before we go past this slide, I want to bring your attention to that pie chart on the right-hand side. It breaks down the, the ages of our bus operators into kind of categories. We There's the, the, the 19 to 24, we kind of treat them as, uh, as the young adults and a fair number, and that's, that's generally college students who drive for us. And then we have a we have kind of the middle age, what we call the second jobbers, and then we have a, an older group that are mostly retirees, not entirely retirees, but but generally that's those are our those are the demographic groups of our operators. So you'll see as I talk further about how we kind of targeted our our strategies toward those different different groups. Next, please. So so the the. Part of the easiest part in a way, after convincing the town of Blacksburg that we needed to raise our wage rates, we raised them fairly substantially with 27% for the starting wage rate for bus operators. And that got us back to pretty close to a, what a market rate was around here for, for comparable jobs. And, and we also kind of brought our part-time operator wage rates more in line with our full-time wage rates. That helped. We were kind of strategic and and setting up premiums for hard to fill shifts, which kind of gave operators another opportunity to make a little extra money. And then uh, just bonus programs in general, the more more hours an operator was willing to drive, then the, the more they could get uh, in their paycheck. So that was that's the front of the first leg of the three-legged approach. The second one is, uh, I think, the, the kind of the most interesting, so I'll spend the most time on it, and that's uh, how we change our advertising an outreach approach. Our marketing folks kind of came to me and said, we need to be creative and we need to target our messaging to those three different groups that we're trying to attract. And it was all kind of done under the, under the drive for BT campaign. I'll show you some examples of that. So here's, a, here's some, some examples of the print, some of the print ads that we ran and and some of some of them are pretty far out there, and we actually got a few a few comments from the public about about how far out there they were. Not these particular ones that I'm showing here, but but the marketing folks said make make people look, get their attention, get away from kind of the the usual um, transit ads in the newspaper kind of things. So that first one was targeting young adults. You need a better job. And the second one for second job is just a little bit short if you need a little extra money. And then the third one is for retirees on, on my other day off, I drive for BT. So those that that's kind of some examples of the of what we did on some of the some of the print and some of that also ended up on the on some of the electronic uh, media as well. Next, please. So on the so in the way we, we try to change the way we we 
We outreach to try to get to different markets, again, getting away from the traditional way of advertising for job applicants. So for the digital and social media, of course, we use Facebook and, <clears throat> and Twitter. We also use Google AdWord, which we found to be very effective. It was a way for us to kind of track what, who, was, who was clicking and how far they were clicking through to find out more information about, about the job opportunities. We did still continue to do some print, newspaper, and some, some magazines, that, that kind of regional magazines that would not be particularly expensive. We showed up at community events. Um, some, of them, some of them were Virginia Tech related. Some were just community events and had our booths and had our buses up there, out there, and, uh, and just kind of we could promote our service at the same time promoting our job opportunities. The, the out of home. That was, uh, we did some signage at particular places and malls, and there's a community college in the area that we advertised there. And uh, we did some, uh, some, some videos at movie theaters as well and, and on our YouTube site. And then landing pages is the last one. We, we created kind of a customized landing page for each, for each one of those three groups of uh, the, the, the uh, the young adults, the second jobbers, and the retirees that were kind of targeted to those folks, and uh, with the, with the messaging and actually some some videos that that I think if we go to the next slide, is that the go to the next slide? Oh, this is more of a generic video that we ran. Um, just and you'll be able to see this. I'm not sure how we're going to set up to, so you all could could access that video, but but you could go to BT's um, website or our YouTube and, and see it. This is, a, this is actually a bus operator on the right who's trying to convince his roommate to, to go and apply for jobs because he's sitting all day and he's making thirteen twenty two an hour where this other guy is just sitting all day and, and not, not accomplishing anything. So that, that was a pretty, pretty well-received little video that was kind of, we ran in movie theaters again on our YouTube website or what, our YouTube site. And the next, the next slide kind of talks a little bit more about our landing pages. <clears throat> this is another one that's that gives information about the job opportunities and, and it gives a little testimonial by, a, by an actual bus operator. This particular one that you're seeing is, uh, is kind of somebody that fits into the, the uh, I don't know, I guess she's halfway between a, a second jobber and a retired, but she talks about how much fun it is working for BT and, and how her children are grown and it gives her something to do and she really enjoys that. So we had bus operators doing doing a, a, a young adult video as well as a second job or and a retiree type video. And, and they, they were happy to do it. And those are the ones that we show in movie theaters and on our YouTube website mostly. Next, please. So the, the third aspect of our strategy was, was retention. And we did, we did several things that you can see on this list that kind of, kind of make people have more ownership and enjoying their job and then hopefully making them stay longer once we have them on board. And we instituted performance evaluations for full-time and part-time operators and all employees, in fact. So we were able to, to provide additional compensation that's tied to performance. We set up an operator management group of about a dozen people, including me, our HR person, um, and several bus operators, and then occasional visitors from other divisions. And we would meet about every other month and just talk about matters of interest. So we could, we as management could share with the operators, give them a chance to have another, um, another place to, to talk about things that are interest of interest or of concern to them. And I think that's really, really helped build morale and kind of have a, get more ownership from, from bus operators. A lot of social activities, and if you can see in that those pictures, that's our on the the top. That's our operations manager at a dunk tank at the picnic a few months ago, and at the bottom is our uh, our dress up for Halloween. So a lot of fun activities. We're giving folks opportunities to to go to training. Um, we had a person go through the APTA Emerging Leaders Program this year. We have. Uh, Folks involved in the, the local chamber of commerce leadership group, and then lots of things that we look for to kind of give people the opportunity to to set themselves up for advancement within the organization. That includes certification and and other other fun activities, and a lot of which involve food, which is not a big surprise. Food's a big hit for everybody. 
So last, uh, if you go to the next one, please. So this is just kind of a wrap up. The paid incentives made a big difference. It's been a couple of years now. We need to revisit that that pay range. I think we're we're beginning to slip a little bit. We've got to figure out a way to keep up with the market, especially with employment being so uh, unemployment so so low these days. The advertising was effective and it continues to be effective. We're going to keep on doing that using that strategy. And our retention is our turnover rate is down and the, the number of hours that our bus uh, supervisors are driving has gone down from 5% of our hours in 2016 to 0.2% now. So, so we think that this is uh, this has worked well and I think a lot of this is transferable to other agencies. So at that point, at this point I'll stop and uh, turn it back to Lisa. Thank you, Tom. I think uh, I've heard from uh, a number of our general managers in transit systems across the state that they started as a student driver. So uh, your program yep. sounds fantastic. So yeah. Yeah. applause applause for that and hope that you can continue to keep it competitive. So uh, any questions for Tom, please go ahead and enter those now. And we'll move on to uh, Joe Green of WMATA and Tim Barham with GRTC to talk about Respect the Ride. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, I just really want to touch quickly on what Metro has done, what WMATA has done with regard to how we reach out to the youth rider, which is one of the largest percentage of our riding population on, on public transit in the Washington metropolitan area. So you can go to the second slide. Basically, uh, you know, just to understand our relationship with the, the youth rider in the metro, in the greater Washington metropolitan community, is that, you know, basically we serve as a, a school bus service. There are no private uh, school bus services for the public school system. And so whether it's our metro buses or our metro rail system, it's the primary way that these students are able to get around the region. We offer this program with, in cooperation with D.C. government where the students get a kids ride free card. And you know this provides transportation to roughly 30,000 students. And really all of us, we have a shared goal of not only making sure that transportation is accessible, but also affordable to remove any barriers for kids to get a good education. So on to the next slide. Our challenges with that particular population is that you know when you have large groups of students, specifically in an urban population, you have issues with horseplay that happen with our, our regular commuters. Um, we've had some unsafe situations. We've had fare evasion when the students lose their fare pay payment cards. And quite frankly, we've had some incidents where we've had extreme violence because if public transportation is a primary way that you get to school, if there's that person out there that you have uh, and you've had disagreements with, you know you can catch them at the metro station or the bus stop. And so quite naturally, the violence that happens outside of our system tends to spill over in the system. We've also had challenges related to how to use the card. There were jurisdictional challenges, meaning that if you were a District of Columbia student, you couldn't use it in any of our neighboring communities or counties or states. So you couldn't take your card and ride all throughout Maryland and you couldn't take your card and ride throughout Virginia. It was only good in D.C. And what happened is the students would get far outside the jurisdiction and, went, and they went into a negative balance, which would keep their card from working until they reloaded it. And then basically it was about, we had some additional challenges around communicating how to replace the cards with the, the schools. It took a lot of time, up to six weeks, so students didn't have the cards, which would cause them to do fare evasion. Um, and then also we had negative interactions with our frontline staff, whether it was Metro Police, our station managers, or bus operators. So we saw those challenges as an opportunity to develop a safety campaign to kind of minimize all of those disruptions, but also to give kids great tips on how to interact with law enforcement and our staff, as well as build the next generation of rider or potential employee. And basically, as I said, just minimize the negative experiences for all customers, not just the students, and to potentially develop an advocacy group of students that would be our ambassadors and through word of mouth, you know, keep any negative incidents from happening. So on to the next slide. Next slide. I guess it's a little slow. Um, we Metro developed what was called a Youth Advisory Council. And with the Youth Advisory Council, um, we went out and started to engage them. We started out in 2013 with the Respect Your Ride campaign, and we launched a summit based 
in DC that brought students from all over the region together in 2016. And we started to host monthly meet meetings with students, <clears throat> team leaders, organizations to talk about what are the challenges uh, that the student riders face, as well as providing them with resources and teaching them more or less about how to ride the system. And one of the things that incentivized students to participate in these monthly meetings was that they were getting community service credit hours, they got a chance to meet with local celebrities and sports figures, but they also got firsthand opportunities to share their concerns and comments with Metro staff. And our Metro staff got a chance to learn about that teen riding population. So it helped improve the dialogue. Now on to the next slide. We continued throughout this process with our students by doing the monthly meetings and we found that our student population and participation levels grew. Um, we used these tactics to engage the students by going out to the schools using street team engagement. We used social media, of course, uh, urban radio and digital radio. Of course, we did print uh, executions where we went out into the schools and posted posters. We also hosted activities even when school was not in, not in session, by taking students to movies, roller skating, and hosting meals with students. And also working with juvenile remediation partners like parole and probation folks with students who had previously had challenges in our system, helping to reintegrate them into uh, the public transit space. And those were all tactics that we used that were to some degree low cost but high impact. We did very targeted media buys and were very conservative in money that we tended to use. And in this particular picture that you see, that's someone from an organization called Sasha Bruce. And Sasha Bruce is a home that helps students that are abused or neglected or students who have experienced some type of um, uh, challenge. They help them in transitioning and finding resources throughout the community. Essentially, what we found is that our, on to the next slide, what we found, found throughout all of our tactics and our outreach efforts was that uh, the student participation level went from somewhere of around ranging from 15 to 20 students per meeting all the way up to about 60 students per meeting throughout the year. So we've had students from Montgomery County, um, Fairfax County, and of course the District of Columbia Schools um, and Prince George's County come and participate in these meetings. And this is just an example of one of the brochures that the students help create and develop. And you can go on to the next slide. What we found was that we really were able to actively get our students to continue to participate. Um, these are just some of the examples of the local celebrities and the student participation where students were doing activities, um, meeting with DJs. We had the students doing engineering activities, team building exercises, um, and you can continue to page through. I encourage you all the transit properties to continue to look for innovative ways and you can you can again page through this was a video of a student testimonial these are some of the outreach again we had metro transit police develop a much better relationship as i said we have 60 core students we've been able to stabilize the incidence of negative interactions in our system um, and we've developed better staff training with our metro transit police department as well as with our um, frontline staff on how to de-escalate situations with the students um, and teaching the students about what their rights, roles, and responsibilities are. And the other thing is that we've learned based on student feedback to alleviate or eliminate the restrictiveness of the past. So what we're now doing is giving students just a regular smart trip card that's coded for them to use and allows them to ride the system no matter what the jurisdiction is. That way they don't have to do the fare evasion if they go outside of the service area, they can just ride the system and the city has agreed to cover that cost. On to the next slide. And you can just keep going. That was just an example of some of the activities we bring in local artists to perform. And these are our next steps. We again hope to continue to, uh, you know, bring the pro keep keep executing the program to move beyond the five schools that are currently re represented to improve our social media interactions. So we have a heads up if there are certain situations that are going on, as well as to inform students about new route changes and service information. We also hope to develop more dynamic content. And that means really to allow students to help us in shaping the messaging because they know what they wanna hear and they know how to speak in the appropriate language that would resonate with their peers. And again, we're looking to hope, we hope to extend um, our program and outreach throughout the summer months when school's not in session. And we hope to focus group test a lot of our messaging and our customer sentiment to see if these activities are making a distance, a, dif a difference. And I think that's basically all I have in my uh, presentation.
I think uh, that's it. Thank you. And I guess I'll take over from here. Uh, thanks, Joe. And what I wanted to do is take a few minutes and talk about uh, uh, operator assaults and some, you know, we've had here in Richmond, and I'm sure other places have experienced this as well, uh, issues as it relates to operator assaults and the interactions that take place between uh, customers and the operators. So I wanted to uh, first uh, present to everyone uh, a self-assessment checklist. So what are some of those things that your organization is doing uh, or can do? Uh, for example, does the organization have a formal workplace violence policy? And does it provide workplace violence training uh, to the employees? Uh, does the organization have customer service uh, policy governing onboard passenger activities uh, to include inappropriate passenger behavior uh, that could cause uh, the agency to refuse passenger service uh, based on safety and security concerns? Uh, does the agency have a formal transit risk management program uh, which can identify and, and analyze and measure specific risks to the organization uh, that they may face? And does it then develop those methodologies to avoid, reduce, control, assume, or transfer uh, those specific risk factors? Uh, does the agency have a formal driver operator handbook you know, covering operational safety and security activities? And do the employee sign the book upon receipt? Uh, does the agency have specific procedures and guidelines for all transit employees to respond to onboard or in transit facilities threats and assaults? Does the organization have formal procedures and, and forms to guide employees in handling documenting transit vehicle incidents? Uh, perceived or actual threats and assaults? Does the organization have a formal accident incident investigative process and have managers and supervisors uh, who do those reports uh, and go to the accident scenes been formally trained on the investigative process? And finally, does the organization have a uh, formal methodology for determining those risk levels of threats and or approaches or recommendations for management risk included. So what are some of those risk factors that are involved? Uh, first, some environmental considerations. Uh, is there a history of incidents on a particular route or a certain area or a certain station, for example? Uh, and on certain routes, is there a situation where you have population density, uh, you know, overcrowding on certain routes? Uh, do certain routes have bars and nightclubs uh, where there might be some activity taking place uh, at certain hours of the night? Um, routes and vehicles, are they capable of handling uh, ridership you know, at certain um, periods of the day? Uh, environmental venues along the route, uh, such as stations, events that may cause congestion. Proximity to hot crime spots, uh, juvenile crime or gang activity, uh, even prostitution or vice or drug activities in, uh, in certain areas. What are some of those operational considerations, uh, such as known threats, measures that are in place to address apparent security risks, uh, measures to address a, a parent security risk as it relates to operator assault and security countermeasures. Uh, training and the skill level that the operators have uh, and other folks that, that work along a certain routes. Uh, are certain routes late on a habitual basis that may create frustration with customers? Uh, is your fleet in good condition? And is it maintained properly? Uh, and then your incident and reporting management system. Do you have a good system in place to, to make sure that incidents are properly addressed and documented? And your fare structure and, and disputes. You know, how do we handle, how do you handle fare disputes and fare issues? And then does your agency or location have a work violence, workplace violence policy 
and, and procedure is that all is that in place and some of those resources that are available for response consideration measures in place to address a parent security risk and, and security personnel policy or security measures that have capability along the route relationship with local law enforcement which is very important uh, as in our case for example we don't have uh, a dedicated transit uh, police within our agency so we have to rely more so on uh, the local jurisdictions to provide that support uh, passengers uh, security inspections you know some places that may have larger uh, agencies that have subway stations and things of that nature uh, are there security checkpoints along the routes along or, or at the stations so from a prevention standpoint uh, some effective countermeasures that can be put in place to address some of those issues for example some physical controls like barriers uh, such as driver shields uh, which we do have here at GRTC uh, does your vehicle, some uh, buses may have left side driver exit doors, for example. Uh, security cameras uh, that are installed as a possible deterrent for, for individuals. Uh, silent alarms and, and radio communication, uh, which allows the communication between the operator or the bus in general uh, to a radio or control center. Uh, GPS. Being able to track the vehicle at all times um, is an important physical control. And uh, improved interior bus stop lighting uh, along the routes as well. And some procedure controls. Uh, some agencies have gone to cashless fare collection. You know, some of our issues do, do initiate as a result of a fare dispute. So some agencies uh, or some jurisdictions have just gone away with fares altogether. Uh, elimination of uh, operating enforcement responsibilities. Uh, in other words, take that out of the hands of the operators and, and have you know, supervision or other individuals handle those type of issues. Uh, posting onboard policies uh, to alert people of your policies and procedures. And having a police presence. Um, if you have a transit agency, for example, or if you have um, uh, cooperation with your local police departments uh, to have a physical presence uh, either on your vehicles or along your routes and de-escalation techniques and you know which goes to training uh, some policy measures uh, well, I mentioned earlier cooperation with the police setting rules and regulations and policy signage uh, being having the ability to prosecute offenders uh, who violate those policies. Uh, management support, support, which is very important. Um, also, making sure your information is out there for the media as well. Uh, in some cases, there's a zero tolerance policy uh, for certain actions that take place. Uh, and in outreach efforts, either with school or some community-based organizations. And legislation uh, to make stiffer penalties if assaults occur to operators, for example. Uh, and on, another countermeasure, communication, onboard communication, uh, as far as radio communication and so forth, surveillance equipment uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier as well. And some of those um, barriers I also mentioned, um, deflecting offenders, and going back to the communication, elaborate a little further, uh, some of your vehicles may have mobile data terminals or MDTs, uh, DVRs that are able to pull the footage, uh, two-way communication, radio communication, uh, and, and cell phone technology as well. Uh, even though most agencies do have a uh, policy as it relates to cell phone usage, while operators are operating a vehicle, or on duty or behind the wheel and so forth, uh, but there may be some allowances to allow the operator to make a call if they are not in the driver's seat or if they are out of the vehicle altogether. And eliminate those perceived risks as well. Um, so looking further at uh, 
what are some of the things that we're doing specifically here at uh, GRTC? Uh, well, one thing we're looking at or have implemented is the rules of writing, uh, which is posted on our website. Uh, but we do have a stipulation there for no assaulting of GRTC personnel. Uh, and if someone does commit that act, uh, we will pursue the uh, full, through the fullest extent of the law. On our paratransit side, on our paratransit ride guide, uh, we also have a similar policy in effect for any customers uh, who are abusive, threats, or, or any type of uh, uh, assault towards an operator. Uh, you may be suspended from service or removed altogether. Uh, we started a couple of years ago with our fleet of installing um, driver shields. We, we did it initially as a test and got feedback from the union and from operators. Uh, and some of it was mixed. Uh, some operators liked it. Uh, some didn't, felt claustrophobic and so forth. Uh, and we didn't put it on select routes. We just put them out there on, on within our entire system, uh, just to you know get the feel from it. Uh, but the majority of folks and, and the feedback was more positive than negative. So we have moved forward with our uh, future procurements of adding that uh, component onto the buses. So so going forward, we will continue with uh, installing driver shields. Uh, when we have safety meetings uh, and refresher training, uh, we incorporate uh, those measures in terms of uh, uh, proper verbal communication, or like we like to call verbal judo, to uh, make sure that our operators and employees uh, work towards de-escalating the situation as opposed to uh, escalating it. Uh, we've had conversations so far uh, with our uh, local jurisdictions, particularly the city of Richmond, uh, to look at implementing off-duty police officers to assist us. Uh, we had that in place years ago, but due to budget constraints and so forth, we uh, uh, had to move away from that. So so we have um, had co initial conversations with uh, our local uh, police chief and others to move forward with that. Um, it hasn't implemented, been implemented yet, but uh, we'll continue to have those conversations and hopefully in the, in the not too distant future, uh, we'll be able to uh, have some type of dedicated police officers working with us. And we had also been following um, one of the House bills from um, the last uh, legislative session, uh, HB 931, uh, where it would be a felony if, uh, if an operator was assaulted. Uh, it was pretty much left in the uh, House Courts of Justice Committee, where I guess it basically died there. But uh, hopefully we will continue to move forward and, and next session that may be reintroduced and, and hopefully that can move forward as well. Uh, something we're also in the process of implementing this year uh, is uh, we'll start transporting City of Richmond High School students. Uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, students ride their system uh, as part of a normal practice. Um, and I was in Baltimore for a number of years, and that was the practice there also, as of, or in the case of a lot of larger uh, cities and locales. So we are slowly moving in that direction here. Um, so, but before we do that, uh, we are working with the city of Richmond. We've had initial conversations with them and meetings uh, as far as putting this program together. And, and we will be introducing it to our workforce. Uh, but before it starts this fall, we are working with the city to um, implement training sessions so that before they come on our bus in that uh, format, we want to make sure that uh, our operators are, are properly trained and equipped of handling a, uh, a, a younger uh, clientele or customer base. Uh, because dealing with students and school kids are, are different than different than dealing with uh, the population as a whole. Uh, we've had that in the past with, in some degree. Uh, we have a program called the Mayor's Youth Academy in which uh, you know, we've been transporting uh, those students through that program and through also our King's Dominion service where a lot of those uh, young people who work up at uh, King's Dominion 
do use our service as well. So, so we've been introduced to it over the past few years. And, and in fact, a couple of years ago, we started uh, a program in which school age children ride fixed route uh, at a reduced fare. So we included them as part of our reduced fare uh, client base as well. So it's gradually been moving in that direction. Uh, we're just taking another step towards that. But we want to make sure that our operators are properly trained and equipped uh, in handling that. And that's basically uh, all that I have. I do want to uh, say one more thing, if I could, Lisa, real quick. Uh, I know Tom mentioned earlier in his presentation about um, uh, the things they're doing as far as retention with Blacksburg. And I will say it, I wanted to thank him uh, in terms of uh, some of the former student bus operators that have come through their system. Uh, once they've graduated, we've you know, managed to hire several of them ourselves. So uh, some of the more uh, productive supervisors we've had, and I know you mentioned some that have moved on to management positions throughout the state, had their start there at, at Blacksburg and, and, and JMU and other college uh, campuses. So uh, I appreciate the, uh, the folks that Tom has brought our way. So, so continue utilizing them, and we'll continue bringing them on our end as well. <laughs> <laughs> we like to keep some of them here, Tim, if we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been a good training ground, so I just wanted to add that. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Tim. We really appreciate all that information. And uh, we have a few minutes left for uh, Bob Schneider to begin to talk about transit talking points for decision makers. Thank you, Bob. Yes, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, Executive Director of uh, PRTC, we're starting to go by OmniRide. Uh, again, it's part of the it's a really good example of where we have our Omni Ride service or Omni Link service, but we're also known as PRTC. And as we've gotten into the discussion with leaders, believe it or not, even though we've been around for 30 years, there were members of our commission who really didn't understand the differences between our services. They didn't understand how all the things fit together. So it, it became really important for me to start to recognize and, and build unity and message and start to really lay a better foundation in terms of what we as an organization do and how it all ties together. We have six different jurisdictions, yet one of our jurisdictions that we collect money for, we don't even provide service. So it's really, really important that we have the ability to communicate in very simple ways what our message would be. So the first slide you see is really just an, it's a very simple, easy to explain, high level, explanation of our service. We're not going to go into all of this. I have a two-page um, handout. When I say it's a two-page, it's one sheet of paper, front and back, and we're going to talk real briefly about these three items. One, this uh, slide you're looking at is just, can you explain your service in 30 seconds or less? It's really, really, really important. There, most people aren't going to remember the fine details of what you explain when you're talking to a Rotary Club or a business leader, et cetera, you're talking to an elected official, but what they're gonna to have to be able to do is be able to come back and understand and get a mental picture of what you've described. So having a very, very simple understanding of what you do and bringing that home within two simple paragraphs is mission critical. Next slide. Our impact. So one of the things we do is we talk about we have a tendency to undersell what we do. For example, our transit ridership is 2.5 million customer trips and 3 million miles. Most people don't talk about how many million miles a year you travel. That's a really, really big impact, but we're unique in that we have a very strong van pool program. If you include our 660 active van pools, that's 1.6 million van pool and carpool riders. And yeah, we actually do talk about the fact that we have partnership agreements with two dozen different area employers to expand commuting options. So the fact that we have presence inside businesses and we have presence inside the DC region that allows telecommuting or engage, ensures carpool, those are all the kinds of things you need to talk about. And yes, talk about your budget. Talk about how much you spend in capital. Talk about how big your fleet is. Because if you don't have these things on paper, once you walk away or you leave this with an elected official or a business leader and they want to refer back to you two weeks later, they've got something that they can talk about. Next slide. 
And then what we do is we, you know, we definitely talk about it in terms of growth and money and impact and explaining who our members are. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, beyond this, this is an overview of what we talk about. Done the slides. Instead, I want to talk about when, when you're presenting to or talking with your leadership in your community or even at the national level, a state legislator, a business leader, or just someone who has an interest, number one, know your numbers. You have to know your numbers. You have to know how many buses you have, how many riders, how many passengers you take per day. Know that, know if you say, oh, our average ridership is blank per day, people say is that number of people per day. Automatically have those answers that are the most commonly frequently asked questions at your fingertips. But more important, What's the trend? What's happening inside your organization, inside your community? And literally tell your story. Have, a, have that elevator speech, that 30-second version of how the organization was formed or what the current big challenges are, but also have a pre-canned rotary speech. That 10-minute ability, that 10-minute canned speech, I, act, I have mine on a thumb drive that's in a notebook and it goes everywhere I go. So that if I'm ever asked to give a presentation or talk, I've got reference notes for myself or I can actually do a PowerPoint very, very easily without having to worry about creating anything new. It should be a very basic program that you've got that you can introduce and you can do it in 30 seconds or you can do it in 10 minutes. Know that you have really four primary audiences. Your four primary audiences are your opponents, your supporters, those that are on the fence, and those that will never care. And any organization, person you're talking to is really going to fit into that group, and sometimes they're all in the same room. For example, in a rotary group, you may have social service leadership that is very, very interested in what you do like the United Way. They're already your supporters. You don't have to sell them hard. You're also going to have opponents who think that transit's a waste of their tax dollars. No matter what you do, you'll never really convince them you're not going to move them either way. Instead, what you're really doing is you're talking to people who are on the fence that might be are really unsure of your impact, and that's a big part of what you're really trying to do is bring that message home to them to demonstrate the value you have to the community on a consistent basis. In that room is also people that will never care. Don't do anything that makes them start being your opponent as well. Don't, cre don't make and uh, enemies out of people who were not, neither friends nor they're just ambivalent. It's okay to keep them that way because they're not going to go out against you, but they're really also not going to go out of their way to support you. And trying to expend your energy that way doesn't always lend itself to success. Know that you do have business leadership out there, such as your chamber, such as your United Way. A partnership with the United Way, especially for local transit systems, is extremely important because United Way is a great fundraiser. They have the pipelines to your top accounting firms, the banks. They, they know how to raise money. If the United Way is your friend, they are going to be helping you with a pipeline into the bank, the business community, people who may not be as supportive of transit historically. If the United Way is your partner, they are going to be talking to the banking community, the, the lawyers, the hospital, talking on behalf of maybe groups who might not be your best supporter, They'll help carry your message. And of course, the retail service economy. We are the transportation for a large amount of their workforce. And they know, the, so the Hotel Motel Association is very aware of the impact you have. Turning them into your, your speakers is a big deal as well. When it comes to your political leaders, you cannot, as, a, as an executive director or manager, you can't be the one that is going to get political. You're politically active and you're engaged but your board needs to be the number one advocate for your transit system, not name the CEO. The advocate's the advocate for service. Your board is the advocate for the organization. And so things like the bi-weekly updates with activities. It's so simple. Every, for example, we get paid every other Friday. Every, every payday, all the directors send the bullet points of the top five to 10 activities, and then we cherry pick from that and send it to our commission one week later. For the first time, they're seeing how many outreach events we do, how many ads we're running, because they don't know. They don't see all those ads. They don't see all the cool stuff like Tom does with 
the Facebook ads and they may not see all the different promotions you do. Pulling all of that together and putting it in one place every two weeks, not in a Word document. Scannable, easy to do, bullet points. We also do articles of interest for the transit system so that we are the information source about transit activities that goes out. And additionally, we pick one transit-based article every single month and put it in the board pack. The idea we're building culture and conversation around mission critical issues for transit so that when our board members go out and are the advocate, they know what we do, they have articles of interest so they're armed with what's happening in the region, and they're also able to talk high level about things like mobility as a service. Finally, when you talk to elected officials, the number one thing that, that they're asking, that they want to know is, what's the ask? Don't beat around the bush and don't be shy. They got into office for the purpose of making a difference. Absolutely take full advantage of that. What's the ask and what are you asking them to support? Second, how will you use it and who will it help? Uh, our counter, my counterpart for this presentation was at a jaunt. His is a one-pager. Mine's a two-pager because we have a little bit of jurisdictional confusion that we always have to undo. But what's, what's the ask? What's the piece of paper? What's the information? What are you asking them to support or not support? And standing down on something or asking them to get in the way of something is just as important. How are you using what you've got is also part of that whole concept of knowing your numbers and making your impact. The one thing that I, the biggest advice that I would give is not, is not being afraid to be a lobbyist for yourself. A great lobbyist's goal is simply to provide trust and information. When, when a successful lobbyist walks in the room and sits down in front of an elected official, they bring with them trust. They don't manipulate information. They don't, they don't manipulate ideas. What they're simply doing is your lobbyist provides access and information for you. You can be your own lobbyist. Your elected officials love to hear from the organizations in their district. You're not, you're not being difficult getting on their calendar. You're sitting down and you're providing information in a trusting way. And the only difference is the lobbyists are in Richmond or they're in DC every day. So access is easier for them. Don't be shy and don't be afraid. Uh, use your local community leadership as well. If your city has a lobbyist, Take advantage of that lobbyist, build the relationship with them so that when a transportation issue comes up, that lobbyist will call you and say, hey, you should get down here. We have something on the way. So those are the highlights. I think I did it in my allotted time. Um, I forgot to set a timer, so I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, VTA is uh, reaching out to work with some of our transit managers and uh, other uh, staff in uh, different agencies around the state to meet with legislators, to create a, a roundtable of stakeholders and to meet with key legislators this summer. So that message is right on target. Um, but there was a question that had been submitted about uh, whether Tim had slides, he did not. So if there are any other questions, at this point we don't have any other questions. So. Uh, at this point, if you have questions later and would like to either submit them directly to the presenter or through VTA, we encourage you to do that. And uh, so at that point, um, I don't have anything else to add. We will be putting this on our website uh, in the near future and we'll let you know uh, so that you can, uh, can uh, target whatever presenter um, and whatever roundtable session that you're interested in and uh, look at it at your convenience. So uh, again, I wanna thank you for participating and uh, thank you for being a VTA member. Have a good day. All right, thank you.